Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men number 139, cover dated November 1980. So this issue comes in the wake of Cyclops taking a leave of absence from the team after Jean Grey's funeral. We In the corner box now we have as the members of the X-Men, Wolverine, Colossus, Storm, Nightcrawler, Angel and now Kitty Pride as well. So our central message, welcome to the X-Men Kitty Pride. Hope you survived the experience and around it we have fragments of the X-Men in various kinds of pearl. Uh, storm up against what you might think is Dr. Octopus turns out not to be, Colossus and Angel battling some kind of robot, and there, most intriguingly, Nightcrawler and Wolverine with a polar bear pouncing at them. So what is going on? Well, we'll discover inside this particular comic, plus something else that is going to be revealed is Wolverine's real name, at least part of it, and also he's going to get a new costume. So this little colouring error here is intriguing um, on the cover in respect of what is about to be revealed. So we get a splash page to open, Something Wicked This Way Comes is the title of the story. That's a line taken from Macbeth, uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth. And we have our creative credits here. Chris Claremont writer, John Byrne credited with the plot and pencils, of course. And that's intriguing because basically the last five issues of Uncanny X-Men that Byrne was um, involved in, he provided the plots and Claremont only the script. Uh, Terry Austin, the inker, Tom Orzakowski, letter, and Glynis Wine is the colorist. So that's a pretty dynamic opening there as Angel flies between these um, um, shot, uh, what would we call them, like um, uh, cylinders, cylinders that he's trying to evade. So where could he be? What could be the uh, location of such a scene? Well, it's the danger room. So that's a really nice double page um, spread of the X-Men training in the danger room and so we begin to see what some of the cover images had to do with and here you go it's Wolverine for the very first time in the brown and orange costume designed for him by John Byrne and up here in the control booth we've the professor working at the controls and walking up behind him the latest member, the newest member of the X-Men, Kitty Pride. She joined, she uh, turned up to the X-Mansion after Jean's funeral at the end of the previous issue in a taxi that um, kind of mirrored and echoed Jean's arrival at the X-Mansion in um, Uncanny X-Men number one. So let's get into the training sequence here. Uh, Nightcrawler ends up in some pearl when Angel knocks right into him and Angel thinks, um, I knocked him off his trapeze right towards that fire pit. He isn't teleporting to safety. I must have stunned him. He's too far away. I'll never reach him in time. And so Angel calls out to the professor, shut down the danger room now. But Wolverine says, don't get yourself in an uproar, Blondie. The situation, to coin a phrase, is well in hand. My hands, as a matter of fact. So he rips a panel out of the side of the danger room wall and catches. He must be doing it super quick because he's able to catch... Nightcrawler before he fought, falls into that fire pit and Nightcrawler coming to there. So a really well drawn action sequence um, opening the issue. Um, you know, it's Byrne who's plotting it. So he's the one who decided uh, to open with a danger room training sequence. Um, Storm ends up in some peril here as well um, as she's grabbed by these tentacles. So it isn't Dr. Octopus. And she throws Nightcrawler down to Colossus to catch. And she thinks to herself here, um, because there's some banter between uh, the different members of the X-Men in this particular scene. And she thinks, I'm not the only one developing a strange sense of humor. After all we've been through lately, I wonder if I should even be surprised. That's something to think about after I've got myself out of this trap. So Claremont there, you know, acknowledging in Storm's thoughts that the team have been through a lot with the uh, death by suicide of Jean Grey herself in issue 137 uh, and then Cyclops leaving the team in the previous issue 138. 
So she sorts out the business with the tentacles and she's free. And then she lands on the ground and Wolverine's already relaxing, lighting up one of his cigarettes there. And he says, I got to admit, darling, I'm beginning to think Charlie made the right decision when he named you team leader after Cyclops left. So Storm now is team leader of the X-Men. The Professor arrives in another little comic moment here in Chris Claremont's dialogue where the Professor says to Wolverine, Wolverine, call me Professor, Professor X, Professor Xavier, or even if you must, Charles. But not Charlie, is that understood? Sure, Chuck, says Wolverine in response. So uh, that doesn't best please the Professor. Um, And Angel apologizes. He says, I know what you're going to say, Professor. My dumb moves nearly got Nightcrawler badly hurt or worse. I'm sorry, it won't happen again. Well, Kitty wonders whether it's safe to enter the danger room now. But of course it is because the program is shut off. And Wolverine says here, sure it will fly boy now these two don't get on they have a an instinctive dislike of each other and wolverine enjoying angel's discomfort he says you've been doing a solo superhero act lately when you've been doing it at all it takes time to get back into harness you ain't done making mistakes bub not by a long shot no need to go overboard worrying about it though we'll help you over the rough spots Hey, speaking of which, uh, or speaking of Nightcrawler, where'd he go? So Nightcrawler arrives in with a tray of lemonade. Because he says here, um, I felt we could all use some fresh squeezed ice cold lemonade. Gather around everyone. And this is another nice little character moment here. You can see that Kitty is um, taken by surprise and fear. Yikes, she exclaims to herself. This is crazy. Each time I see Nightcrawler, I flinch. I can't seem to help myself. I want to like him, but he looks so, and the paws there, different. He gives me the creeps because, of course, Nightcrawler is the only one of the X-Men whose mutation makes him look uh, different, weird, and outsider by appearance. And Kitty's struggling with her natural instinct to flinch there. And Nightcrawler gets it. He recognizes it. He's putting a brave face on things, but he understands and thinks to himself kitty's hiding her feelings well but i know i still make her nervous i've been trying to break the ice between us but so far nothing's worked i'll simply have to keep trying i like her too much to give up and burn will do something with that or claremont will anyway in the upcoming days of future past storyline so wolverine here this is a nice uh, uh, little character bit as well nice move pal except i don't drink lemonade he says Aha, that must be why I brought along a beer. So um, Wolverine content and happy with his beer. Meanwhile, Colossus picks up on the fact that Kitty is um, a little bit um, in trepidation of the danger room. You could have been hurt in here, Peter. I could be hurt in here, she says. I guess I'm scared of it, of what might happen. And the professor thinks, well, he says, you know, that's a healthy, altogether sensible reaction, Kitty. I'd have been surprised and concerned if you weren't scared, because then that would have indicated that um, that she was foolhardy and rash. But you won't be turned loose in here until you're ready, until I'm certain you can cope with anything the danger room throws at you. You've much to learn, young lady. And he says, as an X-Man, Kitty, you'll need a code name to protect your true identity. What do you think of Ariel, he suggests. She's not happy with that. Um, and um, she says, I mean, it's okay, but it doesn't really... Now, uh, Orzakowski has written Send Me, but I think it should be Suit Me. And Storm intervenes um, in a motherly fashion and says, Well now, little one, we certainly wouldn't want to give you a name you don't like. Let's see. What about Sprite, she comes up with. And Kitty likes that better. Uh, Yeah, yeah, but I better not hear any cracks about uh, people pulling my tab. Okay. So the professor proposes a toast to her newest member, Sprite. Um... And Nightcrawler thinks, I hope you will be happy with us, Kitty. I pray you will not be hurt, as we've been hurt. And yet, I fear that sooner or later you will. And of course, he's right about that, as history will prove. And now, this is an interesting little piece, where Nightcrawler turns to Wolverine and says, Wolverine, I've been meaning to ask you, why the new costume? And this is what Claremont writes for Wolverine in response. Why not? And that's great. Like, that's typical Wolverine, you know. He's not going to get into a big explanation or anything like that. Just a simple rhetorical question. Why not? 
and then he asks for a minute with the professor. Now, John Byrne has revealed why he redesigned Wolverine's costume. He felt it was too bright, uh, too colorful, uh, that it really didn't suit a character like Wolverine, who works in the shadows covertly, that the brown and orange was um, a much better uh, color choice for the character. So that is Byrne's explanation of the new costume. So um, Wolverine says to the professor, I've been thinking about my hassles with the government back home in Canada. You know I was part of their secret service till I resigned to join the X-Men. So he says here, trouble is they refuse to accept my resignation for all I know they may even have a warrant out for my arrest. This is typical Byrne as plotter of this. Byrne always um, going over old plot lines that were never resolved and seeing in those old plot lines the opportunity for fresh stories in the present. So that's what he's doing here. He's tying up a loose end in Wolverine's history. And as we'll see a little later in the issue, going all the way back to Wolverine's first appearance in the Marvel Universe um, or in comics or just at all. In any case, he says, it was my mess. I figured it's time I went home to straighten it out. So the professor agrees, but he says to Wolverine, you shouldn't go alone. So um, he, so Wolverine decides, okay, well, if someone's gonna go with me, he picks Nightcrawler. Want to play chaperone misfit, keep me out of trouble? Why not? My mother always said, I like to live dangerously. Besides, I'd like to see Aurora again. She's a real foxy lady. So Nightcrawler there, not just going along to keep Wolverine company, but also um, on the lookout for romantic opportunity. And um, the professor's got a plan for Kitty because she's not gonna be using the danger room. So go with Storm, she'll show you, it's a surprise. So they go into uh, the nearby town of Salem Center. Really great detail in the backgrounds there in Burns' art. And um, Kitty says to Storm, I love dancing, Aurora. Up until now, I was afraid that being an X-Man might mean having to give it up. I'm so glad I don't have to. Look, there's the address Professor X gave us. So this is, so that's where she's going. She's going for a dance class and you can see outside just a little bit of the sign there ms hunter dance academy one flight up but the door is closed so kitty goes in and sees that or it won't open and sees the reason is it's kind of blocked by um is it a a, a mop there or a, a sweet no it's a sweeping brush so she gets so she said thinks to herself boy what a mess whoever takes care of this building ought to be ashamed of himself i'll have it tidied up in a jiffy and then they're able to open the door and enter and go up the stairs. And in the course of that, Kitty says to Storm, I'm a certified genius. So she's very modest. You know, my peers are in the ninth grade and I'm taking college level courses. Academically, we don't fit. Dancing is how I balance the scales. I can't make my body grow any faster and my intellect isn't much good at helping me perform the moves right. Here, I'm just like everybody else. I can relate to kids my own age as equals. Boy, it's nice to be able to do that. So Claremont here um, characterizing Kitty as a precocious genius, um, but also acknowledging she is only 13 and a half and Storm gets that in her thought balloons here. Incredible. Kitty reasons as calmly, as sensibly as Professor X, yet for all of that, she's still a child struggling to hold on to her childhood. I will do whatever I can to help Kitty win her uh, battle to live as normal a life as possible. So they've arrived and here is Ms. Hunter, the dance instructor. And here we go, we get our first good look at her. And you must be Ms. Monroe and Ms. Pride from Professor Xavier's school, right? And Storm is kind of a little bit standoffish. She says, I'm a Roro. And Kitty's more effusive, I'm Kitty, Kitty Pride. I'm your new student, I'm real pleased to meet you. Ms. Hunter, I saw you dance in Chicago before your accident. You were wonderful. So Claremont working in here, a little backstory for Stevie Hunter that we'll get more of in the future. Thank you. And the name Stevie, some iced tea, anyone. And then the scene switches to Canada, but Claremont includes in the third person narration, a little piece about Storm's hesitation here. With that, an effervescent, enthusiastic kitty and surprisingly a slightly wary Storm get to know Kitty's new dance teacher over a pot of iced herbal tea 
as we shift our, sh our scene ahead of day. So what Claremont will develop here is that Storm has a protective motherly jealousy regarding Kitty and is hesitant because she sees Stevie as a potential rival maternal figure. So I like the way that Claremont will give readers in third person narration a little history of a place, a little uh, kind of tourist guide to a place, and he does that here too. So we, the scene switches to Ottawa, Ottawa, capital of Canada. This is Laurier Drive, a pleasant white collar neighborhood. Most of these modest semi-detached houses are owned by professional people, teachers, doctors, lawyers, government workers, all just getting started in their various fields. That's nice stuff. And um, Claremont always very good at that, giving you a, a sense of, of the space, of the location, um, and of life going on in it. And then we zoom in on our focus among them. In number 138A, a brilliant maverick research physicist named James MacDonald Hudson and his wife Heather, an executive secretary for Yukon Oil, one of the country's biggest energy conglomerates. So she gets out of her Volkswagen Beetle with the shopping, with the groceries. Here she is thinking, home, ugh, all I've done the past week was touch base long enough to grab some sleep, shower, and change my clothes. The place is probably an unholy mess. Interesting use of a little screen tone there for the shadow cast from the shrubbery. Really, really great work, great detail in this art, uh, Byrne and Austin um, combined together. And um, she's walking up to uh, the entrance to the house and the post box there, mailbox, figures nothing but bills. How can so little cost so much? And just having these kind of Ordinary life thoughts. Between us, Jamie and I make a respectable salary, yet we still have to strain to make ends meet. We want children, but how are we going to afford them? And now, into the story. Look at the detail there. The door is ajar. Our front door's open. So what is going on? Such a great page, really. No super heroics on it, but this is what Claremont really loved and excelled at. You know, ordinary life. Um, so in she comes, great top-down angle here as she is edging in through the front door. She picks up a, a broom um, as a weapon should she need to use it to defend herself or attack an intruder. She thinks to herself here, if this turns out to be a false alarm, I'll feel so foolish. Into the kitchen she goes and who does she find there lounging around drinking a beer except for Wolverine and smoking in the house too. And, um, and Nightcrawler, of course, so she recognizes Wolverine and his response is, hiya sexy, how you been? Wolverine, Logan, she exclaims. So another revelation regarding Wolverine, his name. And so we have the reunion here between uh, Logan and Heather. And Nightcrawler asks Wolverine, she called you Logan. Yup, is that your name? Yup, you never told us. Wolverine's laconic response, you never asked. So... You know, equivalent characterization there to him not explaining his choice of new costume either. This is a great panel here um, where Heather says, your friend is one of the X-Men, right? Um, uh, this is Night Creeper, she asks. Night Crawler, says Logan. Take a bow, pal, and make nice with the lady. Uh, Till I met you clowns, she and Mac were the only true friends I ever had. So this is a really theatrical bow from Nightcrawler reminds us that he was an artist in the circus in Bavaria. Um, great, great body language there in the art uh, from Byrne. So um, we get a little reference to the last time that Wolverine and, uh, and Alpha Flight, Flight cross, crossed paths in X-Men issues 120 and 21. And at the time, Wolverine and Vindicator fought. Logan, you're not here to fight Mac again, are you? And uh, Logan says, I came to make peace, Heather, if I can. So she says, good, we three have been apart too long. He's in the North Country, Hudson Bay. There's serious trouble up there. Something so dangerous that the minister called in Department H and Alpha Flight. So time passes and along the shoreline of a bay that's bigger than many states, a ball of scarlet fire streaks across the early evening sky. Such a great panel. Lovely colouring as well for the evening time by Glynis Oliver there. Shattering the summertime serenity of one of the most beautiful wilderness areas in North America. Nice top-down shot there on Vindicator flying 
with the pine trees there and the lake. It is a man, James MacDonald Hudson by name, who was Vindicator, formed and now heads the team of Canadian superheroes known as Alpha Flight. And in his thoughts, Claremont has him think, I'm back in battle time, um, I'm back in record time. This battle suit works like a dream. I designed it and its capabilities still continually amaze and surprise me. I enjoy using it too. It's become like an extension of my own body. It's putting my life on the line as a member of Alpha Flight that gives me the willies. So typical Claremont characterization there. We get a sense of the enjoyment of the superpower, but also the moral concern um, for uh, what would become of his wife if he lost his life. And you know, like there's a dramatic irony to that in terms of what um, John Byrne would do with um, Vindicator in the Alpha Flight um, series um, um, a couple of years in the future. Uh, so, awaiting Vindicator at their base camp, two teammates, Dr. Michael, two young men, a Sarsi Indian phys physician, and Corporal Anne McKenzie of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. So these are, um, of course, Shaman and um, Shaman, and I'm just blanking on her name for the moment. We're going to get a vet Snowbird. There we go, and we get a little explanation where the others are: Aurora, uh, North Star, and Sasquatch. They're in the States on a covert operation to kidnap some robot. And that is a reference to Machine Man number 19. So um, Vindicator says, I argued, I lost my temper, I was overruled until our mission is completed. We three are on our own. Your day any better? And um, Shaman says, no, my magics tell me that the creature we hunt is nearby, but I've not yet pinpointed him. So nice top-down angle here on them entering into the cabin and Mac leaning over a map of the Hudson area. I've scoured the forest for miles, he says, around uh, from the air without spotting a sign of him. How can anything so big disappear so completely? So um, then Shaman is interrupted, or like he uh, is alerted by his mystic alarms being tripped. There are intruders, so who is it? Well, we get this image of them transforming into uh, there are various superhero outfits. Um, Shaman here, Vindicator simply puts his helmet back on and um, Snowbird, in her place stands Snowbird, a shape changer, a woman of haunting elemental beauty, yet one who is no longer quite human. So Mac tells her to go outside, find her visitors, but keep a low profile. And she metamorphosizes into a polar bear. And that's the origin of our image on the cover where Nightcrawler and uh, Wolverine are menaced by a leaping polar bear. Uh, so out she goes and Mac thinks to himself, um, he's um, a little worried about her, but really what he's concerned about, and this is classic Claremont, she seems to take on the mental characteristics of the animals she metamorphosizes into. If she should ever lose control, if the beast part of her should ever take over. And I mean, we've just come through the Dark Phoenix saga, so, but that's a classic Claremont trope. Everyone has their dark side, their shadow side, and what if the beast part takes over? And speaking of which, here's Wolverine, who's getting more and more of a handle on his beast side. And so he likes surprising them, coming in the back door, and uh, Nightcrawler with him. Shaman recognizes them. What are the X-Men doing here? I have the foggy Shaman, says Vindicator. Uh, but if it's to set low scores, they'll find us ready for them. So uh, Wolverine pops his claws, snicked there. Vindicator powers up his suit, and Nightcrawler intervenes to stop uh, any fight. He says, we came here to talk, not fight, remember? Don't tell me, partner, tell them, says Logan. Crawler's right, Mac. I wouldn't mind a good scrap, but this ain't the time for it. I'm willing to abide by a truce. And this is a great little comic moment. You can see the hair literally standing on the head of Nightcrawler there as he's surprised by Snowbird creeping up behind him in polar bear form. It's a really good uh, uh, kind of close up there on the polar bear head. I'd say Byrne was using photo reference for that. He does a good job. And comically, Nightcrawler leaps on top of Logan out of fright. Um, and um, Snowbird apologizes. I'm so terribly sorry, I really am. My crawler here recovering as Logan tells him to get off before these bozos laugh themselves to death. 
So Mac is kind of laughing there. He says, relax, Nightcrawler. You've nothing to fear from Alpha Flight, at least. And Nightcrawler thinks, how does she do that? And we'll see that picked up a little later um, as well. And uh, Logan says, you embarrass them, Mac. Usually Nightcrawler is the scarer, not the scary. And that's what we saw earlier in the danger room. You said we've nothing to fear from Alpha Flight. That implies there's something loose in these parts that we should fear. Heather told me there was trouble. So now we're going, we're into getting into the third act here. There is, says uh, Vindicator, big trouble. Fill our guest in on the gory details, Shaman, and the details are gory. So what we get is the story of Joe Parnell and his family out camping near Hudson Bay. They were careful people. Parnell checked in with Ugali Station every day, says Shaman. At first, everything was normal. They were having a wonderful time. Then some huge creature attacks the father and rips into the tent and the boy runs away. Tommy Parnell ran for his life. He didn't stop until a bush pilot found him two days later wandering along the shore, half dead from exposure. The boy's still in shock, almost catatonic. When we found the Parnell campsite, and what was left of his father. We understood why Parnell must have been literally torn apart, says Vindicator. Before the boy's eyes, we think as well that whatever killed him ate him. We saw no sign of Eileen or the baby. Our best guess is they were taken away by their assailant. We, we don't know if they're still alive. I kind of hope they aren't, he says. This mold of the brute's foot should give you a good idea of why. Big foot, right? So... Um, Wolverine recognizes that it's no bear. He says, it ain't no bear, Jamie. It's something a lot worse. How's this for one of life's little ironies, he asks. I come, up, I come up here to tie up some of the loose ends of my life and wind up face to face with the biggest loose end of them all. And of course, that's John Byrne on plot. And I think Claremont is having a little kind of a little joke there in what Wolverine says about, you know, loose ends. That is the way that Byrne would plot. I think Claremont is having a subtle crack at him there um, because Claremont was all about moving forward into the future, new stories and new developments. But here is Byrne harking back to Wolverine's very first appearance in Incredible Hulk 180 from 1974. So this year now, the making of this video, it's October 2024. It's the year, the year is the 50th anniversary of Wolverine's creation. So it's kind of appropriate to be looking at this story, which goes all the way back to his um, first appearance. And Wolverine reveals the identity of who made that foot uh, uh, print, the Wendigo. And now he uh, says and explains to everyone as we get these flashback, flashback images with the classic Marvel um, uh, device of indicating that a panel is a flashback, the curved uh, edges of the borders of the panel. I fought that monster during my first mission, uh, Wolverine says, as Wolverine for Department H. My first mission, my only failure. I'd been sent to deal with the Hulk. I found old Greenskin slugging it out with the Wendigo. I was a bit headstrong in those days. I figured two to one odds made this a fair fight. Um, the Hulk and the Wendigo have a lot in common. Both are ordinary men, transformed one by science, the other by sorcery. According to legend, you see, the Wendigo is a man who consumes the flesh of other men, hence what happened to poor Joe Parnall. I learned later that's exactly what had happened to a hunter named Paul Cartier. So we keep getting in the flashback the images of the fight between Wendigo and the Hulk and then the Wolverine getting involved as well. Between me and the Hulk, we managed to knock Wendigo unconscious. With him out of the way, I was free to complete my original mission to stop the Hulk any way I could. In the end, all I did was make him angry. We never finished that fight. Marie Cartier hit us with some sort of magic whammy, instant dreamland. She never got um, her chance to zap the Hulk though. Baptiste cast the big spell instead of her, taking the Hulk's place for the transformation. When the dust settled, Cartier was cured, Marie Insane, and Baptiste had become the Wendigo. So that's the guy that's eaten Joe Parnell. I was recalled by Department H, the Hulk and Wendigo escaped. 
So, and he continues here. Again, nice top-down angle as Wolverine leans back on the table. Nightcrawler um, hunkered on the edge of the table as well. Um, and Logan continues. I was out of Canada a lot after that, doing my James Bond number. I never got another chance to go after either Hulk or Wendigo. There's just me and the misfit here, Mac, he says. When uh, He says, um, but if you want our help against Wendigo, it's yours for the asking. Truth to tell, it's yours whether you want it or not. So Vindicator says, well, when you put it that way, how can I refuse? Nightcrawler's worried. The Wendigo sounds like a formidable foe. Perhaps I should radio her professor and ask him to send us the rest of the X-Men. But Logan demurs and says, let it be, Kurt. This caper isn't just business, it's personal between me and Wendigo. And me and Mac, there's a lot of grief between us, pal. Maybe this is the time, the place, the chance to get rid of it. So um, Logan says, we need our gear. Uh, Nightcrawler teleports out to get it. And Snowbird thinks, Nightcrawler or says, Nightcrawler vanished. And she thinks to herself, how does he do that? So that kind of picks up on Nightcrawler's earlier amazement at her transformation into the polar bear. So here we go, here's a plan, and these two look like they're getting along now, finally. You know, if I remember right, Wendigo's preference is supposed to be for fresh killed meat, says Wolverine. If that holds true, Eileen Parnell and her baby might still be alive. I might be able to track their scent. So, um, off they go, in pursuit of the Wendigo. This is a great panel here. Nightcrawler looking at the midnight sun way up north in Canada in the in the Hudson Bay area or yeah Hudson Lake area and he's thinking in the thought balloons about Jean Grey and um, he's grieving her part of me wishes that pain would pass part of me prays it never will for that would mean I would have begun to forget and such people such events should not be for forgotten um, and then he calls out to God how could you have been so cruel Nightcrawler hears no answer to his anguish cry in truth he expected none and so he sits watching the brilliant sunset and again i just want to point out that's really really well colored by glennis oliver there such a great panel really good stuff um wherever gene's soul is like crawler prays that it is at peace he pulls himself together and gets to work thankful that no one from the cabin has come for, uh come looking for him and he's thinking or he says here that's that time now to get wolverine to help me lug it inside What's that? Is someone, someone out there? And look who it is. They're not gonna um, have to go looking for the Wendigo because he's come to them. And uh, Nightcrawler can only ask uh, weekly for help. So time to teleport, Nightcrawler. Next, Rage. There we go. Would have been better if this was on a page turn, you know? But 20 pages of story and art from Byrne Two big splash pages, that double page spread in the danger room. Great, great art in this particular issue. No letters page. I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Uncanny X-Men 139. Let me know your thoughts on this issue in the comment section to the video. If you enjoyed my review, please like the video on YouTube and consider sharing it. It really does help the channel. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.